morning and a happy Sabbath to all the church members. To begin our divine service, let's all sing hymn number 108, Amazing Grace. and happy Sabbath to you all. Thank you for joining us through this medium of technology and to worship the Lord. If you all are holding the Bibles in our hand, let's turn the scripture to Psalms 95 verses 1 to 6. Psalms 95 verses 1 to 6. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. 
Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with the music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depth of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dead land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. With this wonderful verses, I would like to take a privilege to welcome each one of you on this divine hour. There are a few announcements. Week of prayer is in progress. It has started on the 13th September 2020. Please be part of this week of prayer every evening at 7.15 up to 26 September 2020. Be a part of and be blessed. Keep all people in your personal prayers as this whole world is passing through the pandemic. Please keep praying for the sick. There is a very special announcement here. This is wedding bells. Ketan waits with Alice Chawan. Ketan Chandan Shive is the son of Dr. and Mrs. Chandan Shive with Alice, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Chawan, getting married on 4th September 2020. This is second reading of the wedding of Ketan and Alice. As we continue to worship, let's meditate on God's words and God may bless each one of us. For our scripture reading this morning, let's all turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. May the Lord bless the scriptures that is read.
हर घड़ी हर जगह कहो हाले Father, 
creator, sustainer, and redeemer of this whole universe. As with thy children, this morning, Father, thy feet, and we pray thee and adore thee. Thou has been so good to each one of us throughout this past week. And thank you for all the blessings of life which thou has given to us. On the Sabbath day, as we worship you, Lord, we ask you to be with us. And we ask you to lead us and guide us. Let be thy holy presence may be with us, each one of us, as we worship you. Father in heaven, this morning, we would like to pray for General Conference and their leaders. We would like to pray for Division, Southern Asia Division and the leaders, unions, conference, sections, and the regions, and all the churches around as they are worshiping on the Sabbath day. Let be thy bless, blessing may be poured upon each one of them. We want you to bless every church and every member of the church. Let thy presence may go with everyone. Father in heaven, we especially pray for Salisbury Memorial English Church and entire membership of this church. Be with them, be with them and bless them. We want you to lead them. We want you to guide them as they continue to worship you in their respective homes, be each one of them. Let there be a peace, happiness, and joy may dwell in each one of their hearts and minds. Father in heaven, we especially pray for this entire world as they're passing through the phase of pandemic. Let thy guiding angels may be always be around everyone. Especially we pray for those that are sick ones. Father in heaven, we ask you to stay thy healing upon them. We want you to touch them. We want you to heal them. Bring them out of this sickness. Father in heaven, nothing is impossible for you. You have raised the people from the death to the life. And we want you to say a word and just take away all kind of the sickness on this earth. Father in heaven, we would like to pray for all those that are in need. Be each one of them and bless everyone according to their needs. We also pray for the speaker of this hour. As he is going to break the bread of this life, we want you to touch him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. As we hear his message, we may be blessed. Many times we astray from you and we make mistakes on life. Therefore, we ask you to forgive all our sins and shortcomings. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life what we give. Giving is not just making donation. Giving is just making a difference in others' life. The, we have to remember the most happiest person is the one who receives is not who received more. The most happiest person is the one who gives more. Giving is the key of success, fulfillment, and prosperity in others' life. May God bless this thought. And uh, I want to remind each one of us, even though we are not able to meet physically in the church, but to send your tithes and offerings. Church has provided a option to deposit your offerings in the bank account as well as you can approach the church treasurer. Thank you. Let all close your eyes for prayer. Let's pray. Faithful Father, thank you for giving the, the gift of eternal life. What all we receive it's from you, Father. What all we have, it's given by you. Now we are returning our portion in the form of tithes and offerings. Accept it and bless it, Father. Use for the mightiness of your development of your kingdom. May thy face shine upon us, Father. May thy grace be with us in each and every hour of the day. Let each one of us be draw closer to you 
so that we all can have thy shadow and the protection on us and each and every hour. May the bless these offerings and the tithes so that we all will be blessed abundantly by thy grace. Ask him these few blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. to introduce the speaker of this hour. It is very difficult to introduce the known person. But people, those are watching this program on YouTube. And therefore, I would like to just give the brief introduction about this speaker. Today's speaker is Mr. Ravi Sigamani. 
Everybody knows who is Ravi Sigamani is here in this campus. But anyone who is from away from this path, if you do not know, let me tell, he is a very kind person. Actually, Mr. Ravi Sigamani, his parents, they worked here in Salisbury Park. His father, he worked in OWPH, and his mother, she served in Hugh McEnry School as a teacher. Even Ravi Sigamani, he, complete, he studied here in Hugh McEnry School, and later, for his further studies, he moved to the south, and then he came back, and he joined NHHS, that is National Health Home Service. After few years of time, he was shifted to OWPH and he was working in accounts department. Later, he had an opportunity to work for AMC for the short time. And again, he was promoted as a treasurer to the OWPH. At present, Ravi Sigamani, he is serving in capacity of estate manager in Salisbury Park. In person, he's very kind, very good-hearted, and he's servant of God. At this time, I would like to invite Mr. Ravi Sigamani to come and share the pulpit. Good morning, and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. A warm welcome to all those who are worshiping with, worshiping with us online. God has been gracious to us and has brought us safely through this week. We have a lot to be thankful for. And we need to come this morning to praise him for all his mercies upon us. We'd we'll like to thank the pastor of this church, Dr. Jane Sable, for giving me this privilege. I'd like to thank the online team, the youth, who are working hard to get this program going. I'd like to thank God for this privilege of opening God's word. This year has seen nature get back at man. When you look at the news, what do you see? Fires everywhere, just fires, burning up everything in its way. Forest fires. You see floods everywhere, washing away homes, cattle, everything, just getting totally destroyed. You see locusts destroying every bit of greenery they can see. In fact, they entered uh, certain cities and towns, invaded their homes as much. Look at cyclones and hurricanes destroying everything in their way. Earthquakes demolishing everything. And the pandemic, pandemic affecting millions and still many dead, many dying with this. Is there some kind of a message in it for all of us? Is God's hand over us or is it absent? Has God deserted us? Before we begin the opening the word, let's bow heads in prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege of coming here this morning into your presence. We pray, Lord, that you'll open our hearts, you'll open our minds, you'll give us the wisdom from above to be able to accept what you have in mind for us. And may we be able to go from here richly blessed with what you have to offer of us. Bless us, Lord, for we pray this few mercies in thy precious name. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to... Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. Now, mind you, this was talking about the Israelites. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water. There was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? 
But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? It's a topic for my sermon this morning. Well, given a situation, isn't that typical of man even today? When something untoward happens to us, we ask the same type of questions. We keep repeating it. Is the Lord among us or not? Is God dead? Why does he not come and intervene in this? Why didn't he do this? Why doesn't he do this right now as he did in the past? Why doesn't he feed the hungry? Why doesn't he heal the sick? Why does he stop all the wars and bring a halt to all these calamities? Well, if God really exists, why doesn't he make himself more obvious? People ask such questions. Often us keep assuming that if God showed himself spectacularly, they would believe and follow him. Well, Exodus tells of a time when God made himself perfectly obvious. The plagues on Egypt revealed his mighty power. Kind of a powerful God that he was. An enormous miracle at the Red Sea provided a sensational deliverance. And a recurring miracle in the morning provided food for the Israelites every morning without fail. And if questions again about God's existence arose, there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night as proof that God was present there. It must have been pretty hard for one to be an atheist at that time. But yet every instant of God's faithfulness seemed to summon up some astonishing unfaithfulness. Despite seeing all this, the people had a very funny view about it. The same Israelites who had watched God crushed Pharaoh, quaked at the first sign of the chariots of Egypt. Three days after a miraculous escape across the Red Sea, they were grumbling to Moses about God and the water supplies. This was at Marah. A month or so later, when the hunger pang pangs began to ignore them, they completely turned bitter. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat on pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us here into this desert to starve us to death. Well, God responded by sending them quails. But the Israelites were soon complaining about something or the other. And right now it was water. And they tested God by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Is that a question we ask today? How many times have we tested God with this type of a query? When we get sick, when we have a problem, when things don't go the way that we planned, when things don't go our way, 
or when we lose somebody dear to us don't we ask god the same question don't we have the same kind of an attitude towards god don't we test god with the same kind of a question the other day we were just discussing with a few friends as to why we were facing such difficult times and there were a lot of responses many responses which came some of the responses were interesting some were a little frightening one response is that we have been straying away spiritually straying away from god we have no place for him we had no need for him he didn't figure in our plans we had our own plans and god had no place in our plans these answers were quite plain and frighteningly true but there was one answer in the whole thing which remained that god was absent here the idea was that because god was absent there were problems and difficulties these things happened because god was not present here now how many of us have felt that if what happened to us or whatever didn't happen to us would never have occurred if god was present there have you ever thought of that well one thing which amuses me quite a bit is setting up an agenda before a meeting many times we prepare an agenda and then go for the meeting and we pray over it and our, and ratify it with god's blessings we ask for god's blessings over it funnily we expect god to approve our plans but will god be a party to it is he included in our plans some few years back when hurricane katrina hit new orleans people wondered if god was sadistically absent but was god really absent in that situation someone said that god was visible he was present in the suffering and the dying people it didn't sound very nice to hear but they said he was in the individuals the communities the schools the churches and the organized aid that was going out to the victims god was with those people who were opening their homes out to these people offering them financial aid offering them help he was with those people the hundreds and thousands who were praying for them but still did that answer sound good to us to hear was an answer which was good enough for our life's problems god promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us how does that sound he will never leave us nor forsake us in this present day scenario is the lord among us or not jesus name manuel literally means god with us but is it so is he in our midst is he active as he was during the time of the israelites many a time we have this thing where we say the god of the old times is different from the god of the new testament people say that people even believe that but is it so is god still in our midst now if you look around about us we are burdened down with a lot of problems we face a gigantic financial crisis we are bogged down with financial prices going crazy and shrinking salaries we face corruption everywhere we are faced with the problem of leadership both in the country in the church where is this leading us let's turn our bibles to deuteronomy chapter 70 31 and we'll read verses 16 and 17 Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 16 and 17 And the Lord said to Moses 
you are going to rest with your fathers. And these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land that they are entertaining. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. On that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and difficulties will come upon them. And on that day, they will ask, have not these disasters come upon us because our God is not with us? Well, during the time of the Israelites, they suffered losses in battles. They suffered difficulties at various times. They suffered famines. Different, different things happened to them whenever God turned his face away from them. Whenever God shunned them, they faced a problem. Now, in the present context, is the Lord among us? Or has the devil taken hold of us? The devil, they say, is roaring. is like a roaring lion, moving around about, trying to devour us, trying to attack us. Are we going to be a prey to his charm? Does he have control over us such that we cannot even recognize the call of God? We cannot even recognize the messages God has been sending to us? Are we that far away? There's a story told during the Second World War where Japan was reigning very supreme in the South Pacific Islands. Well, Japan had attacked the US at Pearl Harbor and with that one blow, they had literally brought the US down to their knees. Well, with that, they controlled the whole of the South Pacific Islands. And they were trying to gain supremacy over a larger portion of it. Admiral Yamamoto was in charge of the Japanese defenses. And he came up with a plan. He wanted to still take control of the whole thing. And he said, I need to make a detailed trip and visit all these islands and get some more reports about them. So he sent a coded message to all his commanders everywhere, expecting them to respond to his plans. Well, unknown to him, the Americans were slowly working on these coded messages. They were looking at it, studying it, and somehow, they got to decode it. And in the final itinerary, when General Admiral Yamamoto sent a message, the Americans too were listening to the same message. The Americans decoded that message, got the whole itinerary of Admiral Yamamoto, and said, let's go and do something about this. Sure enough, Yamamoto, unaware of what's happening around him, took off with his men on in a fleet of planes. And all of a sudden, the Americans came and attacked them. In a span of an hour or so, Yamamoto was dead. The Supreme Commander was dead. And the Japanese Navy was in shambles. Why? Why do you think that happened? Simply because an enemy had decoded this operation order. In one man's tragedy, there's a lesson for all of us. For we too have a decoded enemy operation order. It's readily available to all of us. It describes how Lucifer or Satan intends to attack our church, our faith, and our hope for a second coming. It kind of reveals the believer's strong points and weak points and how he intends to attack and where. And mind you, we have the advantage of knowing Lucifer's plans much in advance. Whatever strategic plans that he has, we have this with us. And some of these are placed on a priority basis. He's going to attack us this second coming. He's going to attack us on the commandments of God. And he's going to attack us on the sanctuary. 
Well, the methods that he's going to use are very subtle. And the first one he lists is working through ministers, the very elect. He's going to work through them. It says in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 472, I will influence popular ministers to turn the attention of their hearers from the commandments of God. Interesting, isn't it? Satan says, I will influence popular ministers to turn the attention of their hearers from the commandments of God. Many a time we have people who are accepting the minister's message without any questions. And they will not investigate for themselves whether this is true or not. They blindly accept what is there for them. It goes on to say that, therefore by working through the ministers, I can control the people according to my will. Satan also plans to use secular minds. He says in page 473, we will enlist great men and worldly wise men upon our side and induce those in authority to carry out our purposes. Can you believe that? He's going to use great men and worldly wise men to do his plans, to do his, whatever he has to do, his strategy. And how? How does he plan to do this? It's very simple. He plans to create rules such that the majority will look at it as a very desirable one. But that will not be obeyed by the people who keep the law of God. It will not be accepted by them. Well, in Great Controversy, the, he describes it very, um, Mrs. White describes it very nicely. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order. And legislation in order to secure public favor will demand for strict Sunday observant. Does this ring a bell? In the present day times, does this statement make any sense to you? I'll read once again. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order and legislation in order to secure public favor will demand for strict Sunday observance. When you look around, People are talking about global warming. People are talking about the environment. People are talking about the kind of load on this earth. The earth struggling under this load. And very interestingly, some of the top leaders have very nicely come forward with a very interesting plan. That is to say that let's keep Sunday aside as a day of rest. Simple. The earth needs rest. The earth needs a break from all of what's happening. Let's bring Sunday down as a day of rest. Brilliant plan, brilliant. The Adventists who are considered moralists because of God's law will suddenly become immoral. The law keepers will suddenly seem to become as lawbreakers. Well, this will only create a lot more frustration and anger. But before Satan orders a full-scale assault, he will attempt to soften up the enemy by some attacks from within. This is in Testimonies to Ministers, it's in page 473, it says, before proceeding, proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. We can separate many from, from Christ by worldliness, lust, and pride. They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth, but indulgence of appetite or the lower passions, which will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination, will cause their fall. I'll read the last bit again. They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth, but indulgence of appetite or the lower passions which will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination will cause their fall. Judgment and discrimination are, per are perhaps the two most important qualities to be attacked by the devil. In the last days, men will not be able to decipher as to what is right or what is wrong. 
They will try and compromise on issues, compromise, walk the middle road, not be bothered about what they do. Now just, just let's analyze what's happening this far. Every time Lucifer speaks, the front opens wider and the wall grows larger. He first begins attacking the Sabbath, then the second coming and the sanctuary. And he attempts to draw ministers into his game plan. Next, he targets legislators, civic leaders, big leaders. And next, he reaches into the personal lives of God's people, looking for soft spots to penetrate. And mind you, he has only begun. It says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 474, his next field of attack is money and property. Go, make the possessors of land and money drunk with the cares of this life. Keep the money in our own ranks. Make them care more for the money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom. Through those that have a form of godliness but know not the power, we can gain many who otherwise do us harm. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God will be our most effective helpers. Those of this class who are apt and intelligent will serve as decoys to draw others into our snare. This is almost real. It's not a figment of imagination by some lady who wrote it here for yesterday. This is happening. Satan has planned all these tactics to distract and to divert our attention, to divide us completely. He wants to use this to intelligently draw us away from where we would believe. He wants to divert our attention, bring a great divide in the church, something that will not be met easily. Well, the plan begins with an attack on Adventism's major doctrines and ends with enemy agents sowing seeds of discord, of doubt about God's truth and about his messenger. It reads like a crime thriller, isn't it? It's happening all about us. And we have been warned about it. Are we going to grumble when we are faced with any of these issues? Are we going to test the Lord saying, is he amongst us or not? Or are we going to backslide and blame the Lord for whatever happened? Well, going back to our scriptural portion, verses 5 and 6, it says, walk on ahead of the people. The Lord tells Moses, walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. What a wonderful assurance he gives us. What a wonderful promise. Isn't that wonderful to see? Despite their grumbling, despite their lack of belief, despite their anger, and despite the way they behaved, God is saying to Moses to go. He would be there before them. God is telling them that his presence would be there with them always, no matter what the problem, God would be there with them. Well, friends, when the time of crisis appears, when the time of persecution comes, when the events of the last day come about, this promise is there for us. He will not leave us, nor will he forsake us, but his presence will be there for us. His work will go on. His message will survive. The ones remaining faithful will be like stars. In Testimonies, Volume 5, verse, pages 81 82, it says, The deeper the night for God's people, the more brilliant the stars. Satan will surely harass the faithful, but in the name of Jesus, they will come off more than conquerors. Don't we want to be with one of those lot more than conquerors? Well, going back to the last portion of our scripture reading, we have the assurance from God. It says, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What an assurance God has given us. 
What a blessing that God is there for us. Emmanuel, it means God is with us. The promise was fulfilled earlier and will be fulfilled all over again. Yes, the Lord is surely with us and he will be with us. Amen. In closing, let's all sing song number 5 to 8, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege that we have of seeing the way you have been amongst us. Lord, we believe you're a God who cares for all of us, and we thank you for your promise that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. In this time of pandemic, Lord, we pray that you will be there for us and never leave us. Bless all those who go from this place of worship, go out into the week ahead. May your presence be there with everyone. Take care of all of them. These few blessings I ask in thy precious name. Amen. Benediction. Now may the great agape love of our Heavenly Father, the grace and mercy of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the holy communion of the Holy Spirit may abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.